Sometimes it may seem like a very selfish and self-centered thing we're doing here. Trying to get the mind into concentration, have a sense of ease and well-being inside. And although it is centered in yourself, it's not self-centered in a selfish way. After all, the more well-being you can find inside, the less you feel oppressed by the world outside. So many people go through life with a long litany of how they've been mistreated. And they feel very impoverished inside. And it's hard to take what other people have done to you. With a measure of equanimity, with a measure of what you might call generosity of spirit. After all, we li are living in a world where everybody's imperfect. We'd like to have perfection all around us, but you have to look inside. Are you perfect? Well, no. You've got your weaknesses, you have your failings. And so you have to learn how to live in a world where people have weaknesses and failings. The best way not to feel oppressed by that is to learn how to develop your own inner resources. So you don't feel so dependent on other people's good treatment of you. This is something I noticed about John Ford. He was extremely independent. Even when he was sick, he did his best to take care of himself as best he could. He was like that monk in the, in the Taragata who finds himself sick in the wilderness. And he asks himself, am I going to go back into civilization to find a doctor? Well, no, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to treat my illnesses with the five strengths, with the seven factors of awakening. In other words, find resources inside that you can depend on. And by giving yourself a sense of well-being in the way you breathe, you're making yourself more immune to things that people outside can do to you. It helps to lift the level of your mind, what the Buddha calls Atijite, the heightened mind. The image he gives is of a person going up into a tower and then looking down at people below. You see people jostling around and running around, running into one another. And the person in the tower is a part. He doesn't feel affected by their jostling and running to one another. And when you think about the, the Buddha's vision of the world, it's a vision that has a lot of compassion, because you're not feeling wounded by the people around you. When you're feeling wounded, it's hard to feel compassion. And the big problem, of course, is that we're, we're wounding ourselves as well. The wounds that other people can give us, there's not much we can do about that, but the wounds that we inflict on ourselves, those are things we can change. It comes down to those three fabrications that the Buddha talks about so much. Right after ignorance and dependent core arising, there's the three fabrications. You've got the breath as your bodily fabrication, you've got directed thought and evaluation as verbal fabrication, and your feelings and perceptions as mental fabrication. And for the most part, as we go through life, especially if we have little training in meditation, we wound ourselves with the way we fabricate the present moment. We breathe in ways that are uncomfortable. We talk to ourselves in ways that magnify our sufferings, magnify the mistreatment that's been done to us. We hold in mind perceptions that are, that are harmful, and we focus on feelings inside. 
That's sap or strength, sap or energy. And even people who meditate, they learn how to fabricate skillfully while they're sitting with their eyes closed or doing walking meditation. And sometimes their old habits intrude. And then they take over when I mean, you leave meditation. You can look at a lot of the Buddhist teachings as recommendations on how to fabricate in new ways. All of his instructions on the breath, learning how to breathe in a way that makes you sensitive to pleasure inside, makes you sensitive even to rapture and refreshment inside. There are other potentials for these things inside, but we ride roughshod over them. So they don't have the opportunity to show that they can give us a soothing energy inside, a comforting energy inside. All those suttas where he talks to people about how to change the way they look at things, basically change the way you talk to yourself, use your verbal fabrication in a new way that lets you see that the real problems are not out there. The problem is inside. But the problem inside can be cured from inside. Learning how to talk to yourself in a way that gives you more energy for the practice, lifts your mind up above your ordinary concerns. Think about that monk who was going to go to the savage part of India. The Buddha asked him, what do the people there curse you? He says, I'm going to tell myself it's good that they're not hitting me. Well, what if they hit you? I'll tell myself it's good they're not stabbing me. Well, what if they stab you? I'll tell myself it's good they're not killing me. What if they kill you? I'll tell myself at least my death wasn't a suicide. That's a really wise way to talk to yourself. It's so easy for the mind to focus on irritations or irritants and to magnify them. It's good to develop the skill where you can minimize them. Think of that image the Buddha has of the sound making contact at the ear and then it stops. But we're like a gong. Once you hit the gong, it keeps on ringing inside. So actually, you can let the un unkind words, stupid words, whatever that other people say to you, just stop at the contact. And see if you can learn how not to reverberate, if you make your mind like a broken gong. Then you learn how not to suffer. So a lot of this has to do with how you talk to yourself. And then that image of the broken gong is just one of the many, many images the Buddha gives you to change the way you perceive things. All those analogies he gives are meant for you to use as perceptions that will more skillfully shape the present moment. So you can develop a wealth of well-being inside. Because if you're going to develop any generosity of spirit, you've got to have some wealth to be generous with. And the good news is that you can generate that wealth from within. It's like you have your own treasury, your own mint, minting money. And for the most part, what have you been doing? Minting play money. You can create actual treasures from within. And you should develop these feelings of well-being. They nourish you. When the mind is nourished like this, it doesn't feel so afflicted by the world outside. Think about the body. As the Buddha points out, it's subject to abrasion, subject to rubbing and striking up against things. But when you're young, it has this ability to repair itself. 
And then as you get older, that ability begins to wear away. And you begin to see how much the body gets worn down just by living in this world. But as long as your ability to do some self-repair is strong, you don't see the ravages of the world around you. We can train your mind to be that way, and it doesn't have to wear away as you get old. Do some self-repair inside. When talking about having a sense of well-being with the breath, it's not that you can do that only while you're sitting here with your eyes closed. When you're doing walking meditation, you want to be able to get a sense of good energy inside and learn how to maintain it. And then from walking meditation, you can carry that into other activities. As you go into the hellhole that's the kitchen, you don't have to suffer because you've got that sense of well-being inside. And that lifts the mind so you don't feel that you're under the, under the bar that someone else is beating you with. You're above it. And when you're above these things, then you can treat other people with a generosity of spirit. And that becomes your good karma. For most of us, our lives are negative feedback. It looks negative in the sense that your unskillful qualities feed on one another. Technically, that's a positive feedback loop. Positive in the sense that it takes one quality and strengthens it. Like the howling of a speaker when you place the microphone next to it. Negative in the sense that it pulls you down. What you want is a doubly positive loop and where your good qualities feed off one another and they lift you up. And you can be open handed then with your good qualities. The Buddha describes a person who is generous as someone who lives open-handed to the requests of others. And when he's talking about being generous with material things, that's one thing. But you can also be generous with your goodness. All too often we treat our good qualities like fine china in the homes. We don't like to bring it out for everyday use because we're afraid it's going to break. And so we bring out only our old, broken things to use. And that's the way a lot of us are. Other people treat us with their broken pottery. Well, we show them our broken pottery, and nobody benefits. But you can be generous with your good qualities, and you find that as you're generous with your good qualities, they don't wear out. Because you have this source of wealth inside. So even though you're centered inside, this is not self-centered in a selfish way. You realize that the source of your genuine wealth, your source of your genuine well-being, is centered in here. It's centered within yourself. So as you center the mind with the breath, that opens the channel so that the goodness you have inside, the potential for goodness, can grow. And as it grows, it can spread around. Come out your mouth, come out your hands, come out your eyes. And you can actually be a blessing for the world. Has that idea ever occurred to you? Give it a try. <laughs>